All right. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we open your divinely inspired word this morning, uh, Lord, I know the attitude of my heart is bread of heaven, feed my soul. I pray that for each one here, Lord, that, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would come and instruct us, that you would encourage us, that you would exhort us, that you'd have your way, that you'd find hearts that are yielded. Lord, some of us are coming in, our hearts have been dented up by the affairs of our lives or the things we're dealing with, our family, friends, work, whatever it is. I pray now for a little while that we can set those things aside, focus on you, experience the fresh filling of your Holy Spirit as we look into your word this morning. We give you this time, give ourselves to you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, you probably notice I'm using my paper Bible. Harvey, you'd be proud of me. <laughs> this is the first time... <coughs> In the five years I've been here, that I've actually used my paper Bible in the pulpit, but I, I'm really liking it. So uh, if you have a Bible, open it with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 46, the 46th Psalm. We're going to look into this. Uh, actually, we're going to take a trip through the Word of God this morning. Uh, starting here and ending here, but we've got some stops to make along the way. I want to, before I get into the text, though, I've got to lay some groundwork. Now, I, I, I want you to understand my heart here. I, I am a little put off sometimes when I hear preachers that it's like all they want to do is talk about themselves <laughs> and not the Word of God. And I've got to, I want to beg your indulgence with me a little bit. I've got to share a bit of my story in order to get to the significance of what God has been showing me and by extension showing you through his word, uh, through the events of the last few months. Uh, but I want to stress, this is his story. It's something he's writing uh, in my life. It's something I believe he wants to write in the life of our church. Because we are it, I am absolutely convinced more than at any other time that we're at the last of the last days and that the time is short. And the Bible tells us to redeem that time wisely. So the other thing about this is this is not a new message. I, I, I am suspect. My eyebrow shoots up if somebody says, I have a new revelation from God. <laughs> Uh, the Word of God is very clear that it is indeed complete. God doesn't need my help. But we do want to look at it, and I want you to understand, and I pray that you come away this morning with a fresh understanding, not of the newness of the message, but of the urgency of the message. Folks, this is urgent stuff. And I don't want us to be asleep. So, I need to go back and, and share what happened to me in order to get to, because uh, the Lord just began to do some amazing things and to show me some things that uh, have impacted my life so significantly that they've really transformed the, the trajectory of my life. They've transformed the trajectory of my ministry, our ministry. Going back to August 2nd in Lincoln City, my wife and I had traveled to Lincoln City <laughs> over on the coast. Actually, we went down to Newport. I had a dental appointment, and, and, and I had one at the beginning of the day and then one at the end of the day. And so I said, well, hey, let's go crabbing. We'll throw our crab traps into the water at Siletz Bay there at Lincoln City. You know, if you guys know where Moe's is there. And, and we'll go just hang out and, between appointments. So we did. And Got a couple of really nice Dungeness crabs. Rick will attest to that because he got them. I didn't. <laughs> so as we wrapped up, I, we had a little red wagon that we packed all of our gear in. And I took this red wagon, dragging it through the sand. And it was <laughs> heavy. Got a, a, a bucket filled now with water and crabs. And, 
and all, and then hauling it up to our car. And Stacy said, I've got to go to the ladies' room. And so she did. And when she came out of the ladies' room, she heard someone scream, man down. And she ran over. She could see a crowd beginning to gather at our car. And she ran over and looked, and I'm going to get a little bit graphic here, but I want you to understand exactly the scene that she walked into, or walked up on. I was laying on the ground behind our car. My skin was gray. My eyes were open and fixed. My bladder had emptied. My tongue, I had bitten through my tongue and it was hanging out of my mouth at an awkward angle. I was dead. And some passers-by at that moment, a couple of guys and, and a young woman, the guy stopped and he got down on top of me and started doing chest compressions. The woman got on her phone and called 911. And so they continued for some time. Now the ambulance service is all the way, of course, on the other side of town. And it took quite a while for them to get there. So finally the ambulance rolled up and they <clears throat> relieved the guys that were doing the CPR. And um, every now and then I would, I, I would stir just a little bit but then go right back to gray skin and all of that. So the paramedics got there and they started chest compressions and Stacy said, oh boy, did they start chest compressions because she said, your body was about that thick by the time because they were just cranking on your chest. I have a number of broken ribs to prove it. <laughs> and they're starting to get better, so that's good. Uh, but so they're cranking on my chest and the one guy is saying to uh, his partner, he, and he's, he's doing a few chest compressions, and he goes, nothing, no pulse. And then he says it again, nothing, no pulse. So they haul out the defibrillator paddles, the defibrillator, <laughs> yeah, those things, the electric shock things, and they stick those on my chest and shout clear and hit me with a jolt. I think it's 700 volts. I don't know. Now, I want you to understand too, this is all related to me. Everything I'm going to share with you, and I'll tell you when things started to come to me, this is all related to me either by my wife or through reading my medical chart. Because I have no memory of this day. And I praise God for it. It doesn't sound fun. At any rate. <laughs> so, they haul out the defibrillator paddles and, and they hit me with a shock and the guy says to his partner, nothing. And they shock me again. Nothing. And at that point, Stacy uh, very assertively said, don't you stop, don't you call it. Because it had been about 10 minutes now. And they were about, she thought, ready to call it. And she said, don't you stop. They hit me a third time and got a pulse. Now, they ended up life flighting me uh, to St. Vincent's Medical Center up here in Portland from uh, Lincoln City. And, and by the time I got there, they, uh, of course, I went to the hospital in Lincoln City. And I'm not going to go into all the details there. But they decided this is over our heads and he needs help from a big facility. And so they helicoptered me up there. And... At that point, they put me in intensive care. Because my body had gone so long without adequate oxygen, it had enough oxygen to get that spark back in my heart, but not enough oxygen to, to supply my organs and all. It went into multiple organ failure, respiratory failure, and had to be intubated. Uh, liver failure, wasn't working. Kidney failure. That wasn't, <laughs> my kidneys were so bad. Stacy asked at one point, what's all that stuff in his catheter bag? And then the nephrologist, the kidney specialist said, that's his kidneys. That's the dead cells that are slept off because his kidneys died. And so obviously in bad shape, 
uh, they also had begun to prep Stacy that uh, because I was in a, you know, they call it an induced coma, sedated and paralyzed because I'm intubated and they don't want you fighting it. And they said, look, we don't know what he's going to be like when he wakes up. His brain went without, went without oxygen for a long time. He may not regain cognitive function. And some might argue that that's the case, but um, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> At any rate, my brain took a hit. I remember after I got home from the hospital, I was laying on the bed, we were watching television, and Stacy said something about the TV, and so I grabbed the remote, and I looked down at this thing, and I might as well have had a rock in my hand. I went, I have no idea what to do with this. <laughs> it, was just, it just dropped out of my head. And a few things like that along the way. My long-term memory took a bit of a hit. So I am going to get to the scripture, but I've got to lay this groundwork first because it's just important to understand the the sequence of events. So at any rate, then my heart began to stabilize. I went into AFib, atrial fibrillation, and they were worried that that was going to do me in and and got on top of that, and then uh, it began to stabilize. My liver began to produce the right stuff, and, and so they thought, well, you know, we're going to take him out of ICU after a number of days and put him up on the eighth floor cardiac unit. They had wires stuck to me and all of that. So as things stabilized, I mean, I still, I, I'm still relating this. I don't have any memory of any of this. Now, Stacy said, <laughs> she said, oh, you were awake, but it was a different version of you. <laughs> uh, and I called that the lights were on, but nobody was home. Because I, <laughs> she related some of the, I'm not going to go into it, but some of the comments I made along the way <laughs> were pretty hilarious. At any rate, so I stabilized. They, they took me to the eighth floor cardiac unit, and I began to recover some, and uh, pretty soon my kidney levels, now there's a, a waste product in your blood called creatinine that normal levels are like 1 to 1.3, somewhere in there. Mine was north of 8. And they were saying, you're going to have to go on dialysis soon because, you know, this isn't working. <laughs> the other thing is the nurse would come in every day and she'd say, do you know where you are? And I would just look at her, and, and I looked out my window, and I was like I said, on the eighth floor, it was all woods. There's a city side and a wooded side on St. Vincent's Hospital. And fortunately, I had this beautiful view. And I looked at her, and I went, Colorado? <laughs> and I, I truly, I had no point of reference. I was in a fog bank, and, and it was, in retrospect, it, it was like driving very slowly out of the fog, because I just didn't. No, I, I, my brain was checked out. Anyway, then I learned, a little funny thing, I learned that when the nurse came in and stood there talking to me, there was a whiteboard behind her, and on the whiteboard it said, St. Vincent's Medical Center, West Pavilion, 8th floor, cardiac unit B. <laughs> then she'd come and say, do you know where you are? And I would read the board. They thought I was a rocket scientist at that point. At any rate, so as I was coming around, this is like 10 days later, um, I barely remember, I had some visit. I barely remember Brian, I barely remember you coming, because Brian was like, I think the first visitor I had, uh, and it's like, I just remember his you know, sitting there smiling at me, <laughs> and I had spoken with people on the phone and all. But as I'm coming around, uh, I, I would try to read, and <laughs> that was not working. So then what I was trying to do was to watch television. Oh, my goodness. All it was was fast food commercials. I could tell you exactly what the new lineup for Subway sandwiches is. I'm the guy. And, and it was either fast food or, and I laughed, I told Stacy later, I said, okay, it's either this junk food that sounds really good. I mean, I'm eating hospital food at this point. And so, you know, pepperoni's not looking like a bad thing. <laughs> and, and I'm eating this, or I'm watching these commercials and it's just back to back and it's like, it's just so boring. 
But I said, you know, the commercials are either this food that's really bad for you or they're advertising prescription drugs that you use to treat the diseases you get from eating the food. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm turning this thing off. That's when things started to get really interesting. And that's where God began to deal with my heart. I, I was restricted to my bed. I could not get diagnosed for three weeks. They could not, I was too sick. My kidneys would not handle the contrast, the dye that they used to do an angiogram. And so the doctor said, no walking around. I was bound to my bed. I had an alarm on my bed. If I tried to get up, even if I moved funny, the thing would go off and they'd come running. And, and so I was like, all right, well, Lord, I'm going to spend some time with you. So because I was still having some trouble reading, I began, I have Spotify, it's a, a subscription service for music, and I began to build a worship list. That first song that I talked about was one of the first ones I came across, and it just blessed my heart. A very emotional time for me too, because by this point I'm coming out of it enough to know that I'm alive, and there's no reasonable explanation that I should be. <laughs> a cardiologist walked in, to the exam room a couple of weeks ago and looked at me and went, wow, I just read your chart. And he went on to say, you're in the 2%. Do you know that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I kind of know that. At any rate, so I'm there and, and, and I'm beginning now to worship the Lord. And I am having a wonderful time. And then, I mean, I'm not listening to music 24-7, but I mean, at, every day at 5 a.m., they would come in and do blood draws, and so I'm not getting a lot of sleep. And so I got in the habit of waking up at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and I still do. I was up this morning at 5, uh, and just having time, spending time with the Lord. So as I'm doing that, God begins to speak. Now, <laughs> no audible voices. My brain didn't get that whacked. But if you have been walking with the Lord for any length of time, you know that part of the work that the Holy Spirit does is he gives you a strong impression and that will always, always, always line up with his word. And I'm laying there in bed one day, one early one morning, it's dark outside, had just finished just worshiping the Lord, like I said, just laying there by myself with my hands lifted up and, and just and weeping sometimes because I was so grateful. And Psalm 4610 came to my mind. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And I thought, well, that's interesting, Lord. What does that mean? How does that apply? And the sense that I had, folks, is that at that moment, now remember, I'm on sabbatical. I'm supposed to be getting a spiritual recharge. And I'll tell you, I, I, was, I was wrestling when I left. And I shared with you guys part of it anyway. I mean, I was really wrestling with some things in my life personally, wrestling with... Or should I retire and, and let some younger guy come in and take the church? What, you know, what do you want? Lord, how do you want me to go forward? And what the Lord showed me through this particular passage was, John, I have set a time uh, aside for you to be still. I don't have any choice. <laughs> I can't get out of bed. I mean, and I was so weak that it took a walker, and a nurse to traverse the eight feet to the restroom. So <laughs> I wasn't going to set any speed records as it was, but just laying there, my body was it pulled through a knot hole, is how it felt, and yet my spirit began to awaken in ways that were so profound and affected me so deeply. I think, okay, Lord, you've got my attention. It was though he was pulling me close in a loving embrace, and saying, I have set this time aside for you to be still before me. And I want to show you some things, son. 
And, and I'm, like, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer at times. Maybe that's what he has to do for me. He doesn't have to do that for everybody. Please don't try this at home. <laughs> but for me, uh, it was like this profound moment of him saying, I've got your attention. And now I want to begin to pour into you in some ways. And I want you to listen. I want you to be still before me. So, okay, Lord, you've got my attention. You've got my heart. And and he began to do this renewal in me that is just amazing. So I'm going along, and again, every morning getting up, and now I'm having quiet time with the Lord. I'm beginning to be able to read more, so I'd haul out my phone and grab my Bible and uh, on my phone and, and read some scriptures and all. And I'm laying there one day, and um, <laughs> like I said, I get this Psalm 46.10, and, and, and I, I was kind of blown away. So then Doug Snow, the guy that I was talking about, is going to be one of the speakers at the, the last day's conference. He walks into my hospital room one day, and, and, <laughs> and he said, good to see you, John. And I said, it's good to be seen. And he looked at me kind of weird, and he said, it's better than being viewed. <laughs> and, and, and I just looked at him and I said, I got nothing to say about that, Doug. I am so glad you're not viewing me right now. <laughs> anyway, I shared with him about this song 40, Psalm 4610. And he said, yeah, he said, it's kind of like the 23rd Psalm, isn't it? And I said, what do you mean? He says, he makes me lie down yeah. in green pastures. And I laughed, and I said, yeah, that's right, brother. And we had a wonderful visit and all. And, and I, but I'm praying about that later, and I'm thinking, he makes me lie down. He makes me lie down. Why would he do that? And the very next line in the 23rd Psalm says, because he wants to restore my soul. And again, I'm, I'm just praising God. So, (laughs) at that point, as I mentioned, I had broken ribs. My tongue was just on fire. I had bitten a pretty good chunk out of the side of it uh, when I initially had the heart attack. And and, and (laughs) I was grumpy. Uh, Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and be all spiritual. I mean, I was pretty crabby. My wife would go, yeah, pretty, pretty crabby. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, you know, John, you've got a choice. You can lean into what I'm doing here and let it have a transforming effect on your heart, on your life. Or you can just be a grumpy old man. What do you want to do? I was so convicted. I was like, Lord, I don't want grumpy. I want to be a witness. I want to shine for you in this place. And I'll tell you what, that started, I had so much fun with staff after that. (laughs) It was just great. And so I'm thinking, and still thinking about this Psalm 46, and and then uh, what came into my mind next was that there's two ways to look at Psalm 46.10. Now, if you look at the whole Psalm, I'll I'll read it from verse 6, as the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. This is the context leading up to be still. The Lord, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord who made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease <laughs> to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. And then he says, be still. And know that I'm God. The next place the Lord took me was in Hosea chapter 6. Verse 1 says, Come and let us return or turn back to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. God began to lay my heart open in some ways and the conviction in my heart for some attitudes of my heart that were wrong. 
He just brought into sharp focus, and I ended up having to ask God to forgive me. I asked my wife to forgive me. Uh, I, I was doing some heavy repenting about that point because I began to see with a clarity that I've not had in some time. And I'm just a sinful man, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm ever so grateful. And yet I need to be able to do business with Him, to stay current with Him, to allow the Spirit of God to flow through me and in me. And, and as I serve Him in the hearts and the lives of other people, I've got to be in good shape. And he was doing a real work. I I began to look at that passage in Hosea and and then look at this in Psalm 46 because what it is, in the context of be still, it's talking about, have you ever watched a war movie and they're all finished with the war and the guys, they're walking along and they're, they're, they're not burdened, they're unburdened. But there's like these smoking ruins all around them as they maybe limp and they got a bandage on their head or whatever it is. That's sort of the picture here of be still. It's the peace that comes after the battle. It's the peace that comes because God has straightened things out. And I began to experience that in my own heart, in my own mind as I'm going through and and God is showing me areas that I need to submit and surrender to Him. Again, grateful. I'm not all beat up. Get right with Him, get right with others, and move on. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us the Lord chastises, chastens those whom He loves. And he scourges every son whom he receives. And if you're without that, there's a pretty good chance you don't belong to him because that happens with all of us. And there was definitely a period of time where I remember Bill Holdridge, who was filling in for me here, came up to visit me and I said, you know, Bill, I, I drifted off to sleep yesterday and I, uh, yesterday afternoon as I was taking a nap and, and I was literally thanking God for this heart attack. Thanking God. I said, now somebody in the world would hear that and go, you definitely have brain damage because that's not something you say. Oh, God, I praise you for a massive heart attack that should have left me dead but didn't. But I meant it, and I mean it. I might, my, my sabbatical, as I mentioned when we got started, it didn't go anything like I thought it would, but it went exactly the way that God had designed it to. And I praise God for that. Anyway, I told Bill, I said, I praise him for the chastise, I mean, the sabbatical I'm going through here. And uh, it's true. So the next thing, I'm going along. Uh, I'm, again, having this wonderful quiet time, being still before the Lord. I'm going along, and and the next thing he shows me, and this this came to me out of the blue, right? (laughs) I'm laying there in my hospital bed, I'm praying and and just having time with the Lord. And again, folks, I want you to understand, this is prayer time. But And you've heard me exhort, if you've been in this church much, you've heard me exhort, yeah, there are petitions, and, and it's good. He wants our petitions. There are intercessions where we pray on behalf of another. That's a good thing, and it's a good, healthy practice in prayer. But if that's where we stop... We're shortchanging ourselves. He wants us to be still before him. He wants us to have, and it was forced on me at that time. It hasn't been since. But he wants us to be still. He wants to speak to us. He wants to inform our thinking. He wants by his Holy Spirit to develop us and mold us greater into, further into the image of his son. That's his revealed will. He says, I just want you to cooperate. And we live in such a busy, busy, busy world and we have stuff. You know, I, the ministry's not, <laughs> sometimes people say, oh, you got it easy. You do a Bible study a week. It's like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> it, this is a busy, busy profession. I love it. And yet my own prayer life had suffered. And I realized, Lord, I'm not 
taking that time, purpose in my heart to take that time, to make that time, to prioritize that time, to be still before you. I encourage you folks, if that's an area that's lacking in your life, it doesn't take much to fix it. Rearranging the schedule a little bit, getting up a half hour earlier, whatever it is, however that works for you, but do it. So the next thing that comes to me when laying there in my bed was, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, out of Matthew 24. And I thought, Lord, what on earth does that have to do with me laying here in this hospital bed? Yeah, I mean, that's a, just a weird hospital verse. I mean, I think, you know, it's like he wants to heal. And, and, and I'm not it's like striving with God, but it, was, it really kind of jolted me. It's like, what does that mean? Why are you taking me there? And so I went. And if you have your Bible open, turn to Matthew 24. Uh, I'll catch the context here. I'll, 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 now, Matthew 24 and 25 are what's known as the Olivet Discourse. You don't have to remember that. But what it is is Jesus goes up on the Mount of Olives and he sits down and he begins to teach. He's teaching his men. And they come to him and say, well, tell us, Lord, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And all that. And all of Matthew 24 and 25 have to do with the last days, with the end times, with the second coming, which, and we'll get to that. And so what he says here, he says, but that day and hour, in verse 36 of Matthew 24, He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now they asked him, you know, when will these things be? (laughs) And he said, only my Father knows. Now they asked him again in the book of Acts, in the first chapter of Acts, and he answers them a little differently. He says, it's not for you to know. Why would that be different? Because he'd already been glorified, and now he knew. But the emphasis that the Lord always, 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 always puts on our consideration for the last days or the end times or the second coming or looking for the rapture is it's not important for you to worry about naming dates. I was telling somebody yesterday, in the 40, almost 40 years I've been a Christian, I've heard so many people <laughs> name dates. And, and I remember in 1988, there was 88 reasons why Christ will return in 88, and it didn't happen, so the guy wrote a revised version, 89 reasons why, <laughs> and, and, and then, and, and on and on, and it's like, and he's real clear here, he says, not important, you be ready, that's the point, point. and that was something that the Lord was showing me, is are you ready? He says in verse 37, but as the days of Noah uh, were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's the, the, the verse that the Lord gave me. For as in the, in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and didn't know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And I'm thinking, well, again, that's interesting, Lord. Uh, a couple of things about that. I began to realize that, and I've always looked at this and kind of thought, well, how corrupt was Noah's, the culture in Noah's day? I mean, they were very corrupt. I mean, for God to judge the earth and to kill all but eight people, that's kind of serious stuff. So I'm thinking, you know, yeah, that was a pretty, pretty bad society. And I look around at our culture, our society today, and think, man, it's getting worse Who'd have thought two and a half years ago that it would look like it does? We'll get to that. (laughs) But then I began to realize for those people, it was just another day. It was just another day. Just like yesterday, counting on tomorrow. And, And... I began to think about that, and I thought, you know, my wife and I got up to go to the, the, do the dental appointments and then to go crabbing. 
And we prayed as we drove out the driveway and asked for safe travel and for God to bless our day, <laughs> which he did, not the way we expected. It was just another day. It was just another day. There is absolutely no way that I, for me to sit here and tell you is remarkable too, there was no way that I could conceive that I would be lying dead in a parking lot that afternoon. It was not, it was like so far out of my mind. And as I related that to this passage, I went, wow. For those people, folks, for us, we got up this morning. It's just another day. He says, I'm coming back for my church. I'm going to take, I'm going to, you know, those who are alive will rise to meet with him in the air. Those who are dead will rise first and, and, and we'll be taken out of here. Am I living expectantly? Did I get up this morning and go, yeah, it's just another day, however, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Now, I was sharing this with a friend in California, a guy we used to go to church with down there, and he, I went to the mailbox one day, and I, I get this parcel, and I open it up, and, and his name was Tom. Tom sent me a t-shirt, and uh, this t-shirt says, Noah was a conspiracy theorist. And then the print underneath says, and then it began to rain. <laughs> and I thought, since I lose a little more weight, I'll get into it. But um, <laughs> I just thought that that was great. But folks, the urgent nature of the gospel, the urgent nature of the business that our Father has appointed us to, the urgent nature, I'll tell you what, I began to really take inventory at this point. I have a brother in Seattle whom I dearly love with all my heart, Bill. I'll say it, if he's watching, Bill. <laughs> he went into the hospital, I heard, and, and had pneumonia, and, and uh, I could not get a hold of him for days and I, I started to get pretty worked up about it. I thought, Lord, if he's gone, I haven't had a chance to tell him, to exhort him, you need to give your life to Christ. I finally got a hold of him. We were on the, on the phone until after midnight. He was very receptive to the gospel. He didn't make a decision for Christ. But am I living expectantly? Am I living with an urgency because today's just another day. We have no guarantee for tomorrow. And once that door closes, we're told in Thessalonians that when the spirit is taken up, when the restrainer is taken out of the way, all hell breaks loose because Satan comes down when the spirit goes up. And that will usher in the last seven years of Earth's history, the Great Tribulation. And yeah, I believe that the church will be taken out of here. The rapture will happen and will actually usher in the tribulation. Seven years of absolute hell on earth. I don't want to see the people I love subjected to that. I don't want to see them subjected to eternity separated from God. I love coming down here. I love you guys. I love shepherding the flock and part of what the Lord has impressed upon me is we need to have a sense of urgency about the gospel. We need to be living our lives with an expectancy that he's going to come back. I don't know if he will before this heart stops beating again. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. If you read in the Gospels, you read in the letters, Jesus left it very open-ended. He wouldn't tell them. And, and, and they lived with a sense of urgency then. It was called the imminency of the Lord's return. It's an imminent thing. It's something that will happen. And laying there in my hospital bed, I was just gripped 
with a burden for the lost, a burden for people who have not responded to the gospel of Christ, who have not trusted that Jesus went to that cross for them. That when he hung on that cross and he gave up his life, it was to pay the penalty that we owe. What kind of love is that? As I mentioned, my last week at the hospital was a mission field. (laughs) I had so much fun. I had this one uh, uh, sweet uh, Filipino nurse. Her name was was Farah. And... um, she she was a believer after she found out that I was a Christian and, and she would when she'd leave my room she'd say, Bye, Pastor John. <laughs> and then one day she pokes her head back in the door, God bless you. <laughs> and then she comes back in and she's showing me her phone and she's got some cartoon with a quote from Charles Spurgeon, whom I love. It's like, oh you got on my good side. Anyway, she said, this is really hard working here because I, I, I work in a secular environment. It's a godless place. And, and by the time that we had several days where she was my, one of my nurses, you know, she was saying, I just praise God. Thank you for the encouragement. And I'm saying, praise God. Thank you. Because she was just a blessing to me. Another woman from Afghanistan, single mom with a, a teenage daughter that had left, that had fled Afghanistan, was here in the United States. And I was able to share with her, uh, her name was Sumer. I said, you know, our church, I pastor a little church in Newburgh, and, but our church made a, a, a substantial donation to the Afghan people a few months back uh, for people that have been stranded there because part of our mission focus, as you know, is far-reaching ministries. And and when I, you guys know I will not beg for bucks, and I never will, but I will let you know about needs. And when I let our church know about the need for people being rescued that were stranded there, I was blown away at your generosity. And I shared this with her, and she was just beaming. Like, really? You guys care about us? You know, unfortunately... Not everybody that we run across is receptive to the gospel. I had one nurse, he had um, a tattoo running down his forearm and said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so I thought, well, great, there's an in. I said, hey, man, I like your tattoo. And he's like, oh, yeah, whatever. (laughs) And I, I tried so much to engage him with spiritual things. And my discernment, was that his, his heart was backslidden and he was running from God. So I just prayed for him and, and left it there. I mean, I didn't, you know, wasn't going to sit there and beat him up about it. But I still pray for him. I don't even remember his name, but God knows. Then there was a guy named Zach. <laughs> he was an RN. And this is right near the end of my hospital stay. Now, the three weeks had gone by and they were finally able to diagnose me, and they were able to put a stent in my heart, and, and all of, you know, things were looking up. I was stronger almost immediately because they had an artery that was like 99% blocked. And um, yeah, it, so I started getting better pretty quickly. And right towards the end, I've got this nurse named Zach, and he walks into my room one day and he goes, so what denomination are you? And I said, well... Zach, I, I, I don't belong to a denomination. I'm a Christian. I'm not a religious man. I'm a very spiritual man. I like to think of myself as a spiritual man. But there's a difference. And, and so I started sharing with him. And he said, yeah, you know, I kind of like to study. I studied with Scientology for a couple of years. <laughs> and I, I went, oh, that's nice. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> I, I maintained. I didn't say, What? He said, but then a few months ago, I bought this Bible. He said, it's not just like a normal Bible. It has all these life lessons in it. I can't remember what they call it. I said, it's an application Bible. He said, that's it. Application Bible. 
He said, I'm trying to figure out how to read this and what that means. And I'm laying there in my bed going, ding, 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 ding. You know, it's like, what an open door. So I said, well, let me tell you what it means, Zach. I said, look, in the very beginning of God's word, in, in the very opening pages, there's the creation, and then God creates man, and then he gives man a woman, and, and things are good. He keeps saying, and it was good, and it's good, and it's good. And then man decides to do the only thing God had told him not to. What he was doing, I said, now God wants to rule our lives. But you've got to understand something. He is a good and gracious and merciful and loving God. He created man for fellowship with himself. That's why Adam and Eve were created. And I'm telling Zach this, and I can tell like the Holy Spirit's working on that end because he's just like right there. You know when you're talking to somebody and they're right there. And, and you know, talking to him for about 45 minutes and I, and I laid out the plan of God. I said, so what man decided to do was to throw off God's rule. And, and virtually the rest of the Bible, every bit of the Bible from that point in Genesis, the first few chapters, till the end of the book of Revelation, is God's work of bringing man back into alignment with him. He's like, oh, no, yeah, okay. And, and I said, now, and then you got to look at the cross and I was able to share the gospel with him. And, and I mean, and he was right there. And I'm thinking, Lord, I just love this time in the hospital. And, and I, I told somebody later, I said, you know, pastoral ministry is such that by and large, you're dealing with other Christians. I mean, and yeah, there, there are some that are not. I said, it, it, the difference it's like the difference between sitting in a library and being at a rodeo. <laughs> and I felt like I was at a rodeo that last week. And, and I'm sharing with Zach, and I shared with him the whole plan of God, and I, and I got to the point of saying, Zach, you got to realize something. The Bible says that in the final analysis, you've either trusted Christ for your sins, or you haven't. It says that in that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You either do it voluntarily because you've submitted your life to him, come back under his lordship, or you've continued to throw off his lordship in your life, and you will bow the knee. And then comes judgment. It's going to be one or the other. I said, there's a passage, and this is the next passage that the Lord gave me, and I'll start wrapping up here. So there's a passage in Revelation chapter 19. It talks about, <coughs> it talks about Jesus coming back. The, this is the second coming at this point. It says that Jesus is coming back. He's not coming on a donkey like he did the first time. He's coming on a horse. And he's coming to make war with the nations. It says that he's got a, a, a vesture, that his robe is dipped in blood, symbolic of his sacrifice, and that he has a name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because he's coming back to judge the nations. So I began to look at that. King of kings, Lord of lords. Romans chapter 13 says this in verse 11, and do this, knowing the time. Now this is written in the first century. It was relevant then and is ever so relevant today. And do this. Not think about this. Do it. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. 
The night is far spent. We're almost there. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So we look at what it is to be still before God, to say, Spirit of God, inform my thinking by your Spirit, through your word, show me, work in me, open my heart to you in ways I maybe have never experienced, and I've been experiencing that. Seeing that I have a burden for the loss that I've never, I mean, I've always been concerned for people that don't know Christ. I wouldn't be a very good pastor if I wasn't. However, just this sense of urgency, like I said, an urgent sense. We live in a world that has fallen apart quick. It's going to hell fast. If you'd asked me three years ago what it would look like today where I read articles about the FBI raiding Christians' homes because they stood on a line in front of a, an abortion clinic... I read an article yesterday that said that the, that the Christians in Nigeria, there are so many people being massacred in Nigeria, brothers and sisters in Christ, more than every other country on earth combined. Folks, we've gotten soft. Do you have a burden for the lost? So what does it look like? I've listed three priorities here as we go forward. What's the takeaway, Pastor John? What? Yeah, you shared your experience. And, and yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm reticent to talk about me a lot, but this last two and a half months has been so profound and the lessons I believe are not just for me. I believe that God left me here for his purposes. My wife, I was laying there on the ground behind the car and prophetically she said, God's not finished with him yet. He's, he's a pastor and, and God's not done. And she said she never doubted that I would live, even though I'm laying there dead, my tongue hanging out, all this other weird stuff. You know, and she never doubted because she had a witness inside that we were going to go forward. Uh, I praise God for my wife. She's the best looking nurse I've ever had too. So, um, The point is, three things. The first is surrender. Is your life fully surrendered? Now, I understand we are all a work in process, in progress. We all have areas that God is working and he's using, and he's working according to his agenda for my life. He's not working his agenda for my life for you. He's doing it for me. That's why I always caution you guys, don't think that you can presume that you know what God's agenda is for the person sitting next to you, especially if that's your spouse. It's not good. But allow him to work in your heart. Is your life, is your heart fully surrendered, wall to wall, for Jesus Christ? If there's a holdout, Let him work in your heart. Be still. Know that he's God. And folks, you don't have to drop dead in a parking lot for that to happen. As I mentioned, not something, somebody, I walked in this morning and said, wow, you've lost weight. And I said, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that weight loss program to anybody. (laughs) But truly, surrender. Surrender. I'll tell you what, there's nothing better. Allow him to just wash you and, and, and to work in you. Put away childish things. That's what the Bible says. You know, when I was a child, I did childish things. If you're like easily offended with people, put it away. More important stuff to do. Kingdom work to do. Put it away. Be surrendered. What does that look like? 
The Apostle Paul says, like I said, you don't have to die in a parking lot, but you do have to die. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, I die daily. What does he mean? He's talking about dying to my own natural impulses, dying to this flesh, this carcass that I got to pack around until I get to heaven. I was talking to a friend right after my heart attack. He says, man, you almost made it. (laughs) I said, I know, I got to wait now. So surrender. The next thing is submit to his lordship. Are there areas of your life where you're throwing off his rule? He's a good, merciful, compassionate, loving, gracious God. He says, submit your life to me. Surrender your life. And then submit your life. Are you living expectantly, waiting for his return? That'll shape your life. That'll shape the way you look at things. The last thing I have here, the third, is to serve. And I'm not talking about stuff to do that flows out of. Well, what I'm talking about is an attitude of the heart. I've got something on my phone here I was going to read to you. This came after my notes, so it's like, okay. I was talking to somebody the other day. He said, man, I want to go have lunch with you. He said, there's only one condition. I said, what's that? He said, that you stay vertical. <laughs> I said, all right, well, you got a deal. But as long as I'm vertical, there's work to do. I don't care if you're 85 or you're 8. There's work to do. There is kingdom work to do. Are you doing it? Or are you thinking, well, you know, I'm just kind of retired and I'm going to coast. I'll tell you what, as I said, I was, I was asking the Lord, sincerely asking the Lord, should I retire from the ministry? I'm 66. And when I woke up, when I came out of that fog bank, it was like, I want nothing to do with retiring from the ministry. There's work to do. Because folks, serving is not stuff that we do. It's an attitude of the heart. Are you a servant? Are you others-centered? Pastor Chris, when he was here, he talked about Gail Irwin's bumper sticker. All it said was others. That was the same guy that every semester of Bible college I went to, he started with a three-day seminar on the nature of Jesus, which is all about others. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he goes on, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. Think about it. Here's God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Are you a servant? Do you have the mindset of a servant? I love seeing that in action. As it's more blessed to give than receive, it's more blessed to serve. There's work, there are things to do. back to Psalm 46. Two weeks ago, Harvey taught on the fullness of times and what that means. Folks, we live in the fullness of times. Last week, Rick uh, Riverman taught us 
in response to living in the fullness of times, how then ought we to live? I, I thought that those were just absolutely marvelous. And I told both of them, we were talking, and I said, you know, that just totally leads into what I want to share with the church on my first Sunday back. Next week, we'll get into Acts chapter 12, by the way. <laughs> Pastor Chris warned a few weeks before that about allowing the wineskin to harden. He says, you don't want to have a hardened wineskin. Well, we've never done it that way. It's the last words of a dying church. Did you know that? We've never done it that way before. Like I said, I'm not going to come in here with a smoke machine and all this stuff. Don't get freaked out about it. <laughs> but we are looking at ways to grow this ministry. We are looking at ways to be able to expand our reach, to expand our influence. Pray for me. I, uh, I spoke with the president of Western Seminary last week about perhaps bringing someone on staff. He's praying about if there's someone in his sphere. I'm also looking at going to Southern California to a Calvary Chapel school and just saying, Lord, is there somebody even in our congregation that can come alongside and help with aspects of the ministry? One of the things that Bill Holdridge told me, he said, you know, I said, Bill, I'm so busy doing so many things and I love doing it. Don't get me wrong. He said, but John, let me, let me exhort you. You need to not do the good thing so that you can do the excellent thing. God has called you to teach, and he's called you to pray. That's my ministry. And I said, yeah, I would love to be able to wind back on, on some of the other responsibilities and allow God to raise someone up. So pray. Pray for our church. This is your church too. Pray that God moves and that he works. Because I believe, we're, I sincerely believe we're entering into a new chapter in our body. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still. It could also be rendered relax and let go or stop striving. And know that I am God. But here's the rest of it. I will be exalted among the nations. How will he be exalted among the nations? He's king of kings. That's how. I don't have to worry. I've started actually being able to watch Fox News again without sitting there grinding my teeth and having the veins in my neck sticking out. I am not worried about that guy in China, I am not worried about the guy in Iran. I am not worried about the guy in North Korea. I am not worried about Putin. Yes, I am very concerned that people are paying the ultimate price. And so don't get me wrong. I'm not being discompassionate. What I'm saying is that I know that he's got this. Why? Because he's king of kings. He will be exalted among the nations. And when he comes riding back in, that's exactly what he's doing. I don't have to worry about it. He also says in Psalm 46.10, I will be exalted in the earth. How is that? Because he's Lord of lords. Folks, we all allow ourselves to come into subjection to someone or something. And it breaks my heart when I look out and I see that for many it's drugs. That's their Lord. It, 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 it's, it, it's got them. I look out and I see for some, perhaps it's pornography, perhaps, perhaps it's some other form of sin. But it's about his lordship. He's lord of lords. He's over everything and anything. And when I'm living in a way that I'm looking for his soon return, I'm living in a way that I'm surrendered to him, I'm living in a way that I'm submitted to him, I'm living in a way where I want to have the heart of a servant and esteem you as more important than me. If we're all doing that, what does that look like? He 
He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. And it hit me like a thunderbolt when I went back to Psalm 4610 after he took me to Revelation 19 and said king of kings and Lord of lords. And I'm looking at that. And then I come back and I see that that directly fits what the sons of... Uh, uh, it was, this is not a Davidic psalm. It's uh, the sons of Korah. What the sons of Korah meant when they wrote this is uh, they were looking at it and saying, yeah, he, I mean, in a sense, it's saying he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. He'll be exalted among the nations. He's over all of it. We don't have to worry about it. You know what? Persecution is mounting in our country and it is starting to happen openly. It's concerning. When I see 87,000 government agents being hired specifically so that they can target the population, I'm not going to get political on you, but I'll tell you what, it's happening. It's unfolding. We live in a dangerous and uh, a world that's growing more dangerous every day. Buckle up. The point here is that we learn to be still. Take the time to be quiet before him as we wrap up. Lean into his leading. That's what it is to be submitted to him. And look for his soon return. Time short. I am so excited when I think about that. And when I, you know, look up for your redemption draws near. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, it's not the end, but that should get your attention and look up. Let's bow our hearts and our heads for a word of prayer and then uh, we'll sing one more song. Father, we're humbled in your presence this morning. Lord, that you would want to speak to us. And Lord, I know it's not me. You know, my prayer is that as I speak forth your word, that the people would hear your voice and follow you because Jesus, that's what you promised. So I pray for each one here this morning. I pray for each one perhaps catching this online that you would find vessels, that you would find hearts that are yielded to your working. Lord, do a new work, do a fresh work. Use us, pour us out on the altar of service. Let that mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. Lord, we look for your return. Today we woke up, it was just another day, but is it? But is it? Lord, give us courage to face the challenging times that we live in. Anoint us, Lord with effectiveness and boldness to share the gospel. It's all for your kingdom. We give ourselves afresh to you. In the name and in the power of your precious son, Jesus, who died for us, all God's people said, Amen. amen.